1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Nine eighty six per Brandon. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will proceed, not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you that you are almighty God, maker of heaven and earth. You are holy. You are righteous. You are truth. You are love. And we come to you and we confess that we have not done the good that you have called us to do, but we have done the evil that you have forbidden. We have lived for our own glory and our own satisfaction. And we have ignored you in the world that you have created. And we deserve the wrath of God. But we also confess that you are good And you are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And you you so love the world that you sent your only son. That we may not receive the punishment that we deserve for our rebellion. But that we would have life. And that we would not perish. And that we would have joy eternally. In infinite in the new heavens and new earth with the triune God and all who have trusted in the promises of God. Father, we thank you that though on Friday night you, your son laid down his life willingly, obediently, though he uh, had every right as creator of heaven and earth, he humbled himself even to the point of death, death on the cross that we, his people, who are united to him by faith, may die with him, that we may rise again. And Father, as we live in this world that is not the way it's supposed to be, when we see brokenness in our government, in our world, in our schools, in uh, our families, in our own hearts and minds, we uh, groan because we need a Savior. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who laid down his life as a good shepherd and rose again and lifted it up because death had no right over him, for he loved the Lord with all his heart and soul and mind and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. Father, I pray that as we open up your word this morning that you would give us eyes to see the glory of Jesus ears to hear his voice calling us, calling us to himself, and hearts that yearn to know him and to make him known. In the name above all names, Jesus Christ, we pray, and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. I must say, um, a responsive reading uh, is is, uh, on point today. Uh, It's very exciting to hear everyone reading scripture together, everyone quoting the creeds, what we believe. It's my favorite part, Uh, just really coming in hot today with all the voices, and that was a great encouragement to me. Uh, The singing, hearing God's word, and I pray that the Lord would guide us uh, during our time today. The last words that Gandalf uttered to Frodo and Sam before he plunged into the darkness was this, fly you fools. And then Gandalf was gone. 
He had saved them from utter death from the Balrog, but now Gandalf was gone. And as Frodo and Sam fled the mines of Moria, their hearts broke and their lives were unalterably changed. No longer did they have their dear friend Gandalf to cheer them, to guide them, to correct them and to lead them on their quest to destroy the ring in Mount Doom. Though they would continue the journey, the path would be long and arduous and their hearts were heavy and burdened. For as they walk the blight of the path with dangers and enemies around them, they long for the innocence and the beauty of the Shire. They wish the ring had never come to them, and they nearly buckled under the weight of their task. They had little reason to hope, because Gandalf was dead. If anybody, if you ever read the Lord of the Rings or watched the movie, the death of Gandalf is one of the most memorable scenes in Tolkien's masterpiece. I remember watching with my children in Crosby for the first time and seeing his little eyes well up with tears, not realizing Gandalf is dead. That day and that scene really captured the heart of the disciples. The weight of loss and disappointment and grief was almost too much for the disciples to bear. And as we open up 1 Thessalonians today, this morning, some of you are like Frodo and Sam who were uh, carried, uh, the grief and sorrow that they carried is what you also carry now. You know the struggle of grief and darkness and heartbreak in a world that is broken by sin, a world that's not the way it's supposed to be. When we t- open uh, uh, our social media and we see bitterness and brokenness and angst and hatred, when we turn on the news and we see uh, tragedies like Nashville, when we see brokenness in our families and our lives, when we get the news from the oncologists, there's nothing more that we can do, and we grieve that a world is not the way it's supposed to be. We feel the weight and the heaviness, and like the psalmist, we cry out, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief. I have cried all my tears. My soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. We have been called to walk on the straight and narrow path, but it is a difficult road to walk. If anyone feels like that this morning, and I know I do often, this is why the hope of the resurrection matters so much. My big idea is this morning is this. All who die in the hope of Christ will be raised in glory on the day of Christ. All who die in the hope of Christ will be raised in glory on the day of Christ. Therefore, what are we called to do? We're called to die in hope. And we are promised that we will rise in glory. Those who have trusted the promises of God in Christ. We're going to look at our first point here. Let me, I'll bring my big idea back up for you. Um, Coming up uh, as a pastor on 10 years here at Ocean Park, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, One of the, probably the greatest thing uh, that I have been granted the privilege and the opportunity to do is to bury your loved ones. And I probably, at this point in 10 years, did 40 or 50 uh, funerals of all different, uh, whether it be your parents, your children, your spouses. And often when I remember the names of those who have come and sat in these pews like you are today and been reminded of the gospel, the conversation I have is, I want you to die well. And when you do, I will preach the gospel 
And I will not waste your funeral because you have not wasted your death. That's the hope that we have. And I could name many names. And I look at your faces and I remember the names of those loved ones who have been faithful, who have set their hope on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not on their own goodness and their own morality and their own ability. For many of those who have died comparatively to their neighbors and friends were good people, but but compared to the righteousness of God, they were sinners. And they knew they needed a Savior and they trusted in the promises of God. Notice verse 13 through 15. Paul is writing to those who are living, who have buried their loved ones, who are concerned when Jesus comes again, what will happen with my loved one that has died? What will happen to me when I die if Jesus hasn't come back? We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep who have died that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. One of the overwhelming experiences of death that I have uh, experienced in Denise's, Denise's mother who has passed away and others is the permanency of death. Emily Dickinson uh, in her poetry writes this, all but death can be adjusted. Dynasties can be repaired, systems settled in their sockets, citadels dissolved. Wastes of life can be re-sown with colors, but succeeding, by succeeding springs, death unto itself, exception, is exempt from change. No matter how hard you try, you can't escape the enormous void that once filled your lives by the loved one that you've lost. Their voice, their touch, their presence. Your home is no longer filled with the warmth and comfort of their presence. You no longer answer the phone to the sound of their familiar voice. The sting of death overwhelms because it separates us from the death of those we love the most. Therefore, we grieve. And so, though when Paul is writing, he is writing to a people who feel the ache of death like Sam and Frodo in that imaginary Middle Earth, like the disciples that uh, Good Friday and Holy Saturday, like you and I who have inevitably been touched by death, and if you haven't, you will be prepared. And though these believers had the right doctrine and they anticipated the imminent return of Christ, they feared about their loved ones. What will happen Will they be lost forever? Will they be somehow overlooked because they're not there to get into the kingdom? And so what Paul wants to do to these believers in Thessalonica and what he wants to teach you and I is he wants to teach you now in order to prepare you when death and loss and suffering come. What these believers now and need now and what you need is not a stiff upper lip, not ways to cope with your sorrow, though those are important, and not to just simply move on with their life. They're not coming back, so get over it. They need the hope of the gospel, which enables them to grieve well. Everyone grieves. But as we can see here in 1 Thessalonians 4, not everyone grieves well. There's a worldly grief that we have uh, that all hope is lost because of death has stolen everything from me. You see this in the first century uh, when uh, Jesus was writing or Jesus was teaching and Paul was writing, hopes are for the living. The dead have no hope, one of the Roman uh, philosophers had. One of the 21st century evolutionary biologists, Richard Dawkins, some of you might know, he says, the brain is what we do our thinking with. The brain is going to rot. There is, that is all there is to it. How hopeless that is. And how easy it is to let grief overwhelm. 
And if you accept the basis of evolutionary theology, because it is a theology that teaches that humanity is nothing more than a chemical byproduct of a cosmic accident, you will at the end of 13, what Paul described, grieve as those who have no hope. Why? Because the world can only offer you hopelessness that when you die, you will rot in the ground. So the question is, what is the difference between evolutionary biologists like Dawkins and Hitchens and the il his ilk who mock the gospel and a Christian who trusts the promise of the gospel? The difference is the hope of the resurrection that we celebrate today and actually every Sunday we celebrate it. Notice at the beginning of verse 13, but we do not want you to be uninformed about those who have what? Fallen asleep. And it's not for some of you who are asleep at this moment. Uh, don't look around you, folks. That's my little uh, passive-aggressive opportunity to poke you to, oh, to awake. We don't want you to be ignorant about those who have fallen asleep. And Paul's words are evoking the very words of Jesus in John chapter 11, where after saying these things, Jesus said to them, our friend Lazarus has what? Fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Though Lazarus, yes, did die physically, Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, has the authority to lift him up and breathe life into him with three simple words, Lazarus, come out. He is able to infuse life into uh, the dead and raise them up because he is the resurrection and the life. He doesn't just have power of life and resurrection, he is the resurrection, and the life. So rather than the worldly grief that only brings hopelessness, the gospel, the hope of the resurrection, gives us gospel grief. Because yes, we need to grieve. In a world of suffering and brokenness and losses, if we do not grieve, it will clog up and it will not allow us to have the healthy feelings. God has created us as beings that need to grieve and need to laugh and need to have joys. If it matters, let it matter. And our lives of our loved ones and those who have died matter. But gospel grief is those who have died in faith. Death is not permanent. Death is temporary. Therefore, Paul goes so far, almost outlandishly, and he calls them, they're just asleep. And we sometimes use sugar-coated language because we don't really like to talk about death. We say the human no longer is enduring the toils of labor, pain, and sorrow, but now they can rest. We don't really believe they're coming back. Or we can say they're in some spiritual soul sleep. That's not what Paul is talking about. What he's talking about is the Christian who closes their eyes in death will awake in the glory of Jesus. A Christian who knows and loves the promises of the gospel grieves differently because they have hope of the resurrection. Notice verse 14 and 15. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus... Not our own ability, not our morality, not our righteousness, not our charity, not our family, not our grandma. Through Jesus. God will bring him with those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, as we read through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this promise of these verses is amazing. Those who die in faith, believing who Jesus is and what he did, will not receive what they deserve. Uh, the New City Catechism says, what do we receive? What happens after death to those not united to Christ by faith? The basic doctrine of the Christianity at the day of judgment, they will receive the fearful but just sentence of condemnation pronounced against them. 
As Romans says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. And the sobering reality is they will be cast from the favorable presence of God into hell to be justly and grievously punished forever. Ocean Park, the hope of the resurrection is those who have died in faith in Christ, united to him, trusting in God's promises, is that we deserve eternal punishment, that through faith in who Jesus is and what he has done, we no longer get what we deserve, but we receive eternal life. That great verse that we were taught, many of us were taught as little boys and little girls, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not receive the just penalty for their sin, shall not uh, be cast away from the favorable presence of God into hell, but what? Have eternal life. The promise of the gospel boldly declares that if those who are united to Christ by faith merely sleep because Jesus' death on the cross has spared them the necessity of death. The just penalty for our sin of, be, uh, uh, for, of being cut off from the presence of God has been paid for. When Jesus, that Good Friday, stood in our place, the power of death was swallowed up in Christ's victory. Furthermore, because Jesus rose from the dead, he ensures that all who are united to him by faith will also rise on that day. Ocean Park, the promise of the gospel is that the risen Jesus will one day return to establish his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, and he will call the names of his people, and they will rise from every corner of all creation. They will rise with glorified new bodies, and then we will always be with the Lord. And when Christ returns, the promise here, though I get ahead of myself, uh, when Christ returns, he will not return alone. He will be accompanied by the souls of those who have fallen asleep, all who live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul in 2 Corinthians writes this, because we know that the one who raised up the Lord, Jesus from the dead, will also raise believers with Jesus and present us with him to himself. If Jesus was raised from the dead, we know that all who died united to him by faith will also be raised from the dead. That is the hope of the gospel. Heaven is not in, in probably folk gospel and folk theology has created this place, and I think it might be country music songs, but has created this spiritual dwelling where we float around and play guitars with our grandfather and run around and all of this stuff, um, and, and it's this spiritual realm. We fish and do all these things, but heaven is a real tangible place, a new heaven, a new earth, where if your grandpa was united by faith, we'll be there and he'll fish and we'll work and we'll dance and we'll have joy. This is the hope of the gospel. It's not a spiritual dimension of with disembodied spirits. It's a physical universe where men and women will eat and work and play and worship in the glory of God. It'll be like the best of the world that we have now, but free from the corruption and prefer, uh, perversion and can't, contamination of sin. It will be as it was in the garden, only better. Ocean Park, when a Christian dies, and all of you will die, and when we lower you in the ground, we say goodbye to the gift of a, a parent or a spouse or a child or a friend. We grieve as we say goodbye to a good gift given by our good heavenly father. However, the bitterness of death, we taste the sweetness of hope. For we have the, the promise that all who have closed their eyes in death's slumber, united to Christ by faith, will one day be awakened by the voice of Jesus crying, Arise. For the God who raised Jesus will one day raise all who are united to Christ by faith. The resurrection that we celebrate allows us to die in hope because all who die in the hope of Christ will be raised in glory on the day of Christ. Therefore, we can die in hope. 
And I'll tell you this, it's been an honor to sit by the beds of those who know they were about to die. And I remember some saying, I don't look forward to the process, but I look forward to the result of being with Jesus. And though the pain ravaged their bodies and it hurt our hearts, they closed their eyes in death. And their spirit went to be with the Lord and there's a day when he will cry out and the dead in Christ will rise. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. We die, those who die, we can die in hope that, and we will rise in glory. On Good Friday, a couple days ago, we gathered together in the sanctuary and the blinds were closed and the lights were off and slowly as the sun set over the horizon and the candles were extinguished and the uh, light, the last candle was hidden in the tomb, the, we felt the heaviness of sin that held Christ on the cross to pay the ransom for many. It was only almost as the darkness has snuffed out the light of the world. But if you put yourself in the shoes of the disciples, that seeming defeat that first Good Friday and the agonizing silence of that Holy Saturday, they knew the brokenness. And for the past three years, they had he been with Jesus when he healed the sick, when he raised the dead, when he taught with profound authority. And as Jesus, or uh, Gil read for us, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. You feel their, their hopes were dashed because they did not understand yet. And yes, yet, uh, yes, and besides this is now the third day since this has happened. The disciples were grieving the loss of their Lord and the Master and their friend. Everything they thought they knew was gone. We live in a day that's not all that different from that Friday evening and that holy Saturday. We look around us and we see a world that is shrouded in darkness. We see governments that are corrupt and oppressive. We see societies that are violent and cruel and downright narcissistic. Families are fragmented and broken and isolated. Our bodies are uh, marred by illness and sickness and disease. We're separated by loved ones, but by words said in haste and selfish pride. We weep tears because death and sorrow and pain overwhelm our hearts in a world that's not the way it's supposed to be. Sometimes we look and we see only darkness and we forget that we serve the God who is light. And as the Tenenbrae service shows us in that last candle that is still burning, as uh, John says in verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. Martin Luther in the Reformation wrote of the power of God which can dispel the darkness. And though this world with devils filled threatened to undo this, we will not fear for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. Here in 1 Thessalonians, Paul is giving us a fleeting glimpse of what is to come. This is the trailer that we've seen like, wow, that's going to be really good. And then on that day when it, uh, Christ returns, the great epic of redemption will unfold before us. Notice verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus will return to earth, not this time as humble and mild, a holy infant, tender and mild, sleeping in heaven in peace, but he will return as a conquering king. Christ, who is now seated at the right hand of the Father, will rise and utter one little word that will mobilize the angel armies and stir the slumbering souls of all who have died of Christ. It's the very promise that we have in Zechariah. That's John. It's the promise we have in Zechariah. Then the Lord will appear over them and his arrow will go forth like the lightning. The Lord will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south. 
And Jesus says, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the corners of the earth, for one and the end of heaven to the other. In a moment, in a twinkling of lie, our long-awaited king, who is the resurrection and the life, will come with such authority and grandeur and glory that the graves themselves will spit out their dead. And the dead will rise, no longer hampered and limited by sin and sickness and disease, and, and, but transformed into glorified bodies, perfectly able to do the will of God, perfectly able and pure to be in the presence of our almighty God. The weakness of this perishable world will be replaced by the imperishable. Our bodies and mind will no longer be encumbered by the weakness and the pain and the frailty of sin. Tim Keller writes this, explains the glorious future that awaits all waiting by faith in the coming of our glorious resurrected king. We will have resurrection bodies like Jesus' body. Physical bodies. And what that means is as Christianity envisions the body and the soul, the physical and the spiritual are together in perfect harmony forever. No other religion envisions that. We will not float around by, as disembodied spirits, but we will dance, we'll march, we'll hug, we'll be embraced, we'll eat, we'll drink in the kingdom of God. It means all of our deepest longings will be fulfilled. All of our greatest sorrows will be swallowed up. Brothers and sisters, the promised return of our resurrected Lord should give us comfort when we grieve. It should encourage us in our grief, it should infuse our grief with hope. You can be faithful in today's trials because they will come in a broken world and the tragedies that we see around us because you have the promise of God's eternal provision, a promise that stipulates hope, endurance, and joy. Every pain you feel in body, in soul, in mind, should you remind you that Jesus is coming again. And when he does, he will wipe away every tear. He will vanquish sin and death. Mourning and crying will be no more. He will restore his very good creation. One of the hymns that we often sing that we must be reminded of that this is my Father's world. And oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let heavens ring. God reigns. Let earth be glad. Ocean Park, the resurrection infuses us with a hope that our risen living Lord will return to gather his people. He will not leave us alone. Notice verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and we will always be with the Lord. Paul is using a metaphor here of people in ancient times who when a, a, a dignitary or an emissary or a great king would be coming in the distance, they would rush to the city gates to, to be able to greet them. And, that, that, uh, and this, Paul is saying, is not a, a general or a diplomat, it's the resurrected Lord, the King of glory. And what is he doing? He's leading the resurrection bodies of all who have died in faith, trusting the promises of God. When Christ returns at the second coming, his glory and grandeur will overwhelm the faithful. The sound of the archangel's trumpet will be like the overwhelming rush of a tsunami, bringing infinite joy that overwhelms the heart of his people. Why? Because the resurrected king is re returning to his city to dwell with his people. This promise of the new Jerusalem that is coming. And on that day, the clouds of glory will surround Jesus as the glory once filled the Holy of Holies. In the book of Exodus, then the cloud covered the tent on the meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Revelation says, behold, he is coming with the clouds, bringing God's glory with him. And every eye will see him, and every, the, uh, even though they pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. And notice the greatest promise of the gospel 
is at the end of verse 17. And we will always be with the Lord. On that glorious new day, they will return to the city of David, the new Jerusalem, where we always will be with the Lord. Keller continues in his book, he says, we're going to enjoy God forever because God is triune within himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been glorifying each other, delighting each other, adoring each other, loving each other. Therefore, God within himself has infinite joy, and we were created to share in that joy, and we were created to glorify in him and to participate in that glory and joy. But none of us, even the strongest Christians today, have ever experienced what that joy is. Perfect, cosmic, infinite, endlessly growing because all of us worship and adore other things. Someday, when Jesus returns, we will be freed from sin and we will know and experience that glory and joy and we will enjoy him forever. Brothers and sisters, this is why the resurrection is the center of God's plan for history. And it's the basis of our hope in our resurrected bodies and those who have been united to faith by Christ, who have fallen asleep. Christ's resurrection is the promise that God will dwell with his people forever. The resurrection allows us to die in hope because one day God will raise his people in glory. For all who die in the hope of Christ will be raised in glory on the day of Christ. We die in hope and we will rise in glory. But I want you to see at the end of uh, verse 18 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I have it underlined in my Bible. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. One, three encouragements. Trust in the risen Christ. The resurrection is a big deal, folks. And it's something we make much of every week. But today, we uniquely look at the resurrection. But on this day, many people come and and they play around with religion and they see its importance and its goodness and, and how it can help us with our neighbors and it brings order to society and, and things like that. But that's not enough. The question now is you have seen the resurrected Lord. You have heard his words read and sung and recited. Who do you say that Jesus is? As Jesus himself asked Peter and the disciples and he asked all of us, The question that all mankind must answer, who do you say that Jesus is? Some say he was a legend, the tales of wishful thinking about uh, hopeless disciples. So others, very contemporary, say he was a good man. Even Islam honors Jesus, and other religions honor Jesus. Gandhi was a big fan of Jesus. They say he was a good man who taught good things, but he died a very tragic end, never to rise Again, but unique about the gospel that we're confronted with, that Jesus says, I am the risen Lord, and that if the resurrection is true, and I believe it is, the promised Savior, he is the promised Savior who has come to redeem his people from the shackles of sin by fulfilling God's righteousness and offering himself as a substitute on the cross for the wages of our sin. Yet death could not hold him, and three days later he rose from the dead victorious. And this risen Lord calls you today. Who do you say that I am? Follow me. Second, or therefore, each day we repent and believe. We repent of living on our own for our glory and us calling the shots, and we trust in God and believe him. And if we believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, there is nothing that God cannot ask us to do. Because we did not get the destruction that we deserve, and he calls us to follow him. Do you believe in the risen Lord? Second, if you do, you can have hope in the midst of grief. Because the darkness cannot overcome light. Death is not the end. Sin and sorrow and suffering is not the end. 
though it causes our heart grief. And it's not just that we sin, all of us sin, but we live in a world where we're sinned against. And we say, God, what are you doing? Won't you do something? And we look to the cross where God took sin so seriously and hated sin so much that he sent his son to die to pay the full amount of our payment. He didn't sweep it under the rug. He didn't uh, dismiss all charges on a hung jury or not enough evidence. He paid the price himself and he calls us to trust in him. With the promise that darkness cannot overcome the light. Death is not the end. The dark, uh, darkness of pain and sorrow and injustice in our world will not and cannot overcome the light because the darkness cannot overcome. Keep trusting in the promises of God and endure to the end. That when you close your eyes in death and I preach a funeral to your family members, I won't waste it. I will call them to Jesus. And somebody will preach mine if the Lord doesn't return. And we will always be with the Lord when he comes back. And third, wait for Christ's return. The promise of the gospel is there, though there will be a day when the broken, wounded, downtrodden will be made whole. Satan will be van vanquished to the pit. All mourning and sorrows and sorrows will be wiped away. It will be like being awakened from a bad dream. I remember this week, I, I had a dream. I don't really remember it. Something happened to Crosby, and I woke up, and I said, where's Crosby? And I realized he was in his room, and he was safe. And I was relieved. And it reminds us of the resurrection. There's a day that's coming when we will wake up and all those things that happened will be untrue and no longer and their tears will be wiped away. Why? Because the, uh, Jesus Christ paid it all. And he rose from the dead as a, uh, a foretaste of what's coming and all who are united to, death, to Christ's death will also rise on that day and we look forward to that day. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. I ask you this morning, do you know Christ? Do you hope in the, his death and his resurrection? And do you rate his return? For all who die in the hope of Christ will be raised in glory on the day of Christ. The hobbit's journey from Mount Doom was filled with danger and treachery and struggle. Yet they accomplished their task and they destroyed the ring, yet it was at great personal cost. They lost members of the fellowship to death along the way. Their bodies were disfigured and their hearts were scarred by the evil they experienced. Yet they finished their task. And after the ring was destroyed, the two faithful hobbits were rescued in the, in the blink of an eye and brought from Mount Doom to the safety of the elves in Rivendale. And Sam and Frodo slept peacefully there. In one of the glorious scenes that the movie doesn't get right, but the book is wonderful, Tolkien describes Sam waking up. Jesus in Lord of the Rings makes me cry. Oh. And as Sam woke up, he saw Gandalf. And he, and, and he cried, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. And he says this, is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happening to this world? And Gandalf said, a great shadow has departed. And then he laughed. And the sound was like music or like water in a parched land. Though Gandalf fell into the mines of Moria to his death to save those he loved, it is a picture of the story of Christ's redemption. It's the shadow of the one true story, how Christ died. He entered in the abyss and the darkness of sin, and he defeated it. And then he rose, and his resurrection changes 
everything, infusing resurrection hope, that very hope that we celebrate today. Ocean Park, there is a day coming when we will all close our eyes in the slumber of death in a world that is shrouded by the darkness of sin. And we will open up in a world that is transformed by glory when Jesus calls our name. And there we will explain every, explain, exclaim, everything sad has come untrue. Like being awakened from a dream to realize everything sad has come untrue because of the resurrection of Jesus. Therefore, all who die in the hope of Christ will be raised in glory on the day of Christ. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for the cross where you took matters into your own hand and the sin and the darkness of a world that did satisfied their own lusts and desires and did what was right in their own eyes and has brought only bondage and darkness and hopelessness. But you left heaven and humbled yourself even to the point of death, death on a cross, that all who are united to him, to Christ by faith, will rise again on that day when you return and you call our name and will rise glorified, renewed, and we will always be with the Lord. And we look forward to that day. And all God's people said,